All right. Okay, so I want to get started. Today's lab is a little bit time sensitive in the sense that we're going to probably need every minute to get everything set up, installed, and get you to be able to step through operating uh, OpenStack a little bit. So I don't, want, I, don't want, I don't want to run short, so I'm going to get started now. So first and foremost, thank you for coming. I know it's Thursday at 11 a.m. I know everybody's tired, ready to go home. Um, but I appreciate you coming out. I will try to make this as enjoyable as possible um, and uh, throw in as much information as we can in the next uh, 90 minutes, okay? So we're going to be deploying OSA. OSAD, OSA, it's the same thing. They keep changing the name. It'll be a different name next week. Don't worry about it. Um, and we're also going to operate OSA. And what I mean by that is we're going to do some things that you would do as a cloud operator. Everything that's out there now, right, OpenStack is usually about the user or the developer. But what about the guy who actually has to run this thing? So we're going to step through some scenarios that you would do as a cloud operator and demonstrate how you can use Ansible to make your life a lot easier when stepping through those, those uh, instructions, okay? So... So getting started, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a cloud solution architect at Rackspace. Um, the division I work in is called RPC, uh, which is specifically we, I am in charge of building OpenStack clouds. So we have a lot of private clouds at, at Rackspace, but I build only private clouds built on OpenStack. Um, that's some of my information there. Feel free to f hit me up on Twitter, LinkedIn, GitHub. I have some stuff out there on GitHub, as well as I have a blog that you can uh, find some useful OpenStack information. Over 17 years of IT, I am a New Yorker. Um, funny story is I'm actually moving to Texas uh, in two weeks. So I'm a New Yorker Texan at this point. Um, always been a cloud advocate and um, you know, hybrid clouds are my favorite. So I like doing private and public and there's some other information there. I am a DJ and a motorcyclist, but I forgot to put that on there. Okay, cool. And these are just some of the companies that I've had a chance to work for, but we don't care about that stuff. We want to learn about OpenStack. Uh, so some quick ground rules, and that goes, you know you guys already know this, but um, turn your, I'm not going to ask you to turn your mobile phones off, but if it rings, I now claim it. I have an iPhone 5. I've been looking for a nice 6S, so anybody who has a new phone, Make sure you leave it on and let it ring, okay? Um, asking questions is very important, so don't hesitate to ask questions. Um, if you have to have a side conversation or you need to take care of something for work, I know we're all professionals here, just please go outside so that we, uh, we can get a little, keep focused here. Um, again, we already know about the small groups. Um, and yes, this is where all the materials will be. Um, it's actually there now. Uh, so you can uh, go down there and, and to GitHub and uh, take, that, take a look. That, that link will take you to GitHub. Um, so before we get started, um, as I said, those of you who have the student handout, it has some information on there that, that you'll need for the lab. Um, the student ID, instructions on how to connect to the deployment server, and, and also the IP address of the OpenStack server you're going to do. So what we're going to do today is we're going to use a deployment server to deploy OpenStack to the OpenStack server. Okay, so that's pretty much what you would do in a standard OpenStack build. You would use some sort of deployment server to build your OpenStack environment. Um, specifically with OSA, you want to do that because when you bring down all those playbooks and build OpenStack using those playbooks, it creates like a dynamic inventory on the deployment node. So you want to have a server that has that, that dynamic inventory so that you can keep doing things to your cloud. It just makes things easier. Uh, and again, we will be working with the command line in Ansible. So if you're not familiar with that or you feel uncomfortable, whoever hopefully you're partnered with can take on those, those responsibilities. Um, but it's really easy stuff, so don't worry about it. Um, and again, we will be using the OpenStack client, OSC, to do some of the uh, Ansible stuff, which is actually new, the new client for OpenStack. Okay. Oh, I'm going to put it again when you get to the lab stuff, but yeah, here it is. When we get to, there's another slide that have, that have the information again. Okay, take the pictures. One, two, three. All right. Um, so, so if we're going to start, yes. Yes, yes, that is lowercase yzz capital A zero and then the capital letter O. <laughs> Don't blame me for that. That's Google's fault. 
I have nothing to do with that. So deploying OSA, um, if you're not familiar with what OSA is, um, it's a combination of using Ansible to deploy OpenStack. Right? It's, to me, is the easiest method that I've found to deploy OpenStack in the sense that not just easy, but it's also flexible. And it is something you can use at an enterprise grade. Right? So we're not talking about DevStack or, or anything else. We're talking about a true deployment of OpenStack, whether it be on all-in-one or whether it be on a thousand node cluster that we, like we did with the Innovation Center with Intel. Same thing is what we use. So this is just a kind of overview. We're going to prep the Ansible playbooks to install OSA. So there's some prep work you have to do before you can actually do the install. Um, you're going to prep the OpenStack server as well, because you have to prep that server as well before you can do the install. You have to do some networking stuff and install some repositories that you need, um, as well as then we're going to kick off the OSA install. And then while the OSA install is running, because it will take some time to run, we're also going to then start talking about OSA and learn a little bit more about it, right? So we're going to do a double task. So we're going to kind of jump into the install, get it running, and then we're going to step backward and, and learn more about OSA, okay? All right, so this is what I need you to do. Anyone who has one of those lab sheets, I need you to go to this URL um, in your browser. And that will hold the steps or the instructions for the first part of the lab, right? So get to that URL. Um, then after that, you need to be able to connect to that lab environment server. So if you're holding your student sheet, it's the environment that's at the top here, the very first one. And you're going to use the username and password that's on that sheet there. If you don't have it, I'm sorry, you, you, can't, you can't do that. So you're going to have to just watch me do it when I, when I go to do it, OK? Sorry. It's, you need my environment to be able to do it. Uh, don't yell at me. I apologize. But you said that we could, we could actually follow some of these things as well outside? Yes. The yeah, you'll just need to be able to create. So if you have the capability of creating two cloud servers right now, I can probably include you in the lab. Um, I can push the playbooks that you need to set up those machines. But basically, outside of here, all you need to do is set up two servers and then use those two servers to, uh, to execute the lab. All right, does everybody have this URL up who has the lab sheets and have they connected to the lab environment? I need a show of hands. Is everybody ready? Because I'm going to move. I'm going to move. I'm going to keep it going. All right. You can't access what? Is anybody else having a hard time getting to that URL? It's case sensitive. Tell you, you guys are really smart. It's the same thing. <laughs> yeah, this one goes directly to the instructions for the lab. The first one went to the main GitHub repository. Okay, so okay, so right now we're going to jump right into it, and like I said, we're going to come back and. Um, talk about OSA a little bit. So I'm going to actually step through the lab as well, right, so that those of you who can't participate, you can actually see what those who are doing it are, what are they are doing. So you should have opened up this text file that's called install OSA lab text. And I'm going to connect to the, the lab, uh, the deployment node. You wanted to make this bigger, right? Can't see it? Is that better? You can't see anything on the screen. What? Oh, it's mirroring me, isn't it? Yes, it is. All right, that's not going to work out. So let me talk. Hold on a second, OK? Ta-da. Watch my machine crash. Yep, just did. That's great. No, it literally did just crash. <laughs> OK. Yeah, it works. So hopefully you're stepping through the lab, stepping through the instructions. You don't have to wait for me. Eventually, my machine will wake back up.
Yes, please. Yeah, this is so not going to work out. Mm. Yes. Okay. No problem. Is that better? Yes, two cloud servers. What's that? Mbutu. Mbutu. Fourteen oh four. What's that? I'm sorry again. This is going to be Kilo. Yes. Uh, once we get past this point, when we do a deep dive, I'll show you where you will define in GitHub what tag to pull down in OSA. And depending on that tag, it, depend it will tell you what version of OpenStack you'll pull down. Yes.
Yes, yeah, these are actually public IP address because these are actually, we're running this on, um, we're running this on public cloud, Rackspace public cloud. Yes. So the first playbook you run in here is basically going to prep that server for OpenStack. So as you already know, OpenStack requires NTP. That's actually one of the most important functions that you have to have in place. If the time of your servers are not accurate or not coordinated, your OpenStack cloud actually won't work very well. So this playbook will install that prerequisite. It will also install some other um, app get uh, packages that are needed. So hopefully you should be past this point, correct? So, all right. So is everybody running the setup everything already? Oh, set up everything. If you completed the setup everything already, then you, you're, I need to hire you like right now. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, no, that one is done. But you have to move on. There's another, uh, there's another, the next step to do. Yeah, there is no saying. Pools. Yes. So. Perfect. Spot on. <laughs> yep. I'm hiring you now. You got a job. You want to work at Rackspace. You get to work from home. I'm saying. You don't actually have to go to an office. Yes. So did you? Okay. So where are you right now? Okay, so you're on the deployment server. Did you? What is the username for SSH? It's already, it should have the SSH key, so you actually don't have to use the username yeah. and password. So I already set up the, I'm done with this. So yeah, so it was able to talk to it. Yeah, but right now I'm not able to do it. Because the last task was to restart, but. Yes, you have to wait. Yeah, that's why the instructions, it says you got to wait at least five minutes for the server to restart. Well, I can see. Yeah, it doesn't, yeah. Just because a machine came up doesn't mean that all the services are there for you to SSH to it. So you got to just give it a minute. It's restarting. So after you run that first playbook, the server restarts. So you got to give it a minute to come back up because what it has to do is, is it has to go in and create some network bridges. Network bridges are a really big part of OSA as well. That's how you can get your full deployment of Neutron to work. That's how the containers communicate with each other. So we'll go through that uh, once we get past this install part in more detail. But that's why the server had to be restarted. So if we had to install this in our lab, uh, what are the periods in the right. sense uh, server-wise? Right. So server-wise, again, we'll go over it no, later, but I will, I'll tell you right now. So server-wise, it needs to be running Ubuntu 14.04. That is the operating system that OSA runs on right now. They're working on adding more, like CentOS, but right now it's Ubuntu 14.04. Uh, obviously, the machine has to be able to run SSH, um, NTP, and there are network requirements. There are three network bridges you have to create. And again, I'll, I'll go in a little bit more detail about it. So th but those are the high-level prerequisites. Commodity. What's that? It's up to you. See, that's the part that OSA doesn't involve in. It doesn't involve in laying down the OS. Yes. Yes.
Yes, in this lab, I created, I created cloud servers running Ubuntu 14.04. So that part, we jumped past that part, right? Nobody, nobody likes building machines, so uh, we jumped past that part. The playbook just did it for you. The playbook did it for you and rebooted the machine. So once the servers come back up, all those bridges are already created and done. Yep. OK. So is everybody able to move on at this point? Have their servers come back up? Oh, see, mine is not up yet either. You have a problem? Um, I could do that for you. What student number are you? Seven. Seven? You, are you sure it didn't reboot? I'm not sure it did. <laughs> okay, that's fair enough. I like your honesty, so let me take a look. So, seven is up. Sure. Yeah, I know it makes you feel like you've lost the, that machine, but believe it or not, it's, um, yeah. This one is still down. It hasn't come back up yet. And you said four? What's that? Yeah. All right. Well, that's fair enough. Let me dig deeper. Yeah. So that's the only problem with network bridges is that technically the cloud server doesn't want them or like them. So it rejects it, rejects it, rejects it, and then finally the machine will boot up. So it takes a lot longer than it would a normal server to reboot after you create those bridges. All right, so yeah, five minutes is what, the, what I generally do is wait five minutes. I know. This. What's that? Yeah, you, yeah, you got to, so once you get the server rebooted and run the next step, it'll actually bring down the Git, it'll bring down everything you need to run the playbooks. So the playbook name is prepdeploy.yaml. Once you run that guy, you'll be able to do it. Okay, so my server is back up now, so you guys' servers should be back up now too. <laughs> yeah, so you don't have to actually put a password in because the SSH keys are there. So we're, we're, we're behaving like we're really dealing with cloud, right? We don't do usernames and passwords in cloud. Is anybody having any issues? Looks like everybody's having issues but me. <laughs> yes. Okay.
Yeah, so if you're not connecting from that deployment server, then you're not going to be able to get in. Yeah, but he's trying. Okay. Yeah, so you, did you do a sudo su when you were in the deployment server? You got to do sudo su. You got to be you got to be the sudo. You got to be super sudo. It's important, right? Because you're using going to use the root the credentials that are there for the root server for the for root on the deployment node. <clears throat> you got to follow my instructions. It's very important. I promise you it works. Do you get? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Oh, GitHub's down. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah. Never done. Never done. You sure about that? Yeah, right. I don't know. Okay. Why did it not? Uh... Control V. Oh. Okay, you do it. Sure. You do it, because I'm in that weird angle. So just do this for a second. And just click on it because it's right there. Oh, oh. <coughs> see, there is a B blob missing. Blob oh, okay. Missing. All right. Got it. <coughs> okay. So, where is everybody? I need to see playbooks running, it's very important to me. Right, so I'll, I'll show you when we step through the other instructions, but what happens is inside of OSA, there's configuration files. And in those configuration files, you basically will, can point it to whatever release you want to. Right, so it, it's, I'll, I'll, it'll make more sense once I show it to you. I know you, uh, you asked me about that before. Okay, is everybody running these playbooks? We have to set this server up. Oh, that's not good. Move cache into place all in one. No such file or directory. Yeah, I'm not sure. Even on Lisa. Huh. That's Osa that's having a problem. Try running it again and see what happens. It may be, hmm. Yeah. They changed the repo on me. I hope not. Let's see if we get better result. I'll come back, okay? Yes. Yeah, but you have to move into this directory. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the the first thing I see is yeah, you're running this on your machine, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah you have to be on the deployment server. Yeah. Uh, well, you, let me rephrase that. You don't have to be, but I see. So yeah, so you see the host file in there. Yeah, yeah. That would that's what you would be editing with the password, the, the IP address of your all-in-one server. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All-in-one server. Yeah, you would have to update that. Update. Yes. Is it running again? As long as it's in boot to 14.04. But I wouldn't encourage you to use AWS. <laughs> you running? 
Yeah, it's going to take a while. All right, so this is where I'm going to start talking again, since that's going to take a while. If, you run, if anyone have runs into any problem running the setup everything and it errors out on you, try running it again. Um, that's actually OSA that you pulled down, and it's running, and it, the repo is the dynamic, so something could have changed if you run into a problem, so just run it again. Um, and hopefully it won't fail again. Okay. So if yours is running, um, great. If it's not, um, you can keep going at it. But I'm just going to talk a little bit about OSA now, all right? So now that we have some time. So OSA. <clears throat> so just giving you some background around OSA and how it started and, and where, you know, how we got to where we are. So back in November 2014, um, the community voted to accept OSAD, at, it was called at the time, um, the playbooks for OSAD uh, as a stack for repository. So basically the OpenStack community embraced OSAD and said, you know what, we'll stand behind this, we'll stamp of approval, you can use this method to deploy OpenStack, right? So basically saying this is the way we're going to use Ansible to deploy OpenStack. Um, and just so happened that Rackspace were major contributors to creating OSAD. Um, but then next, at the Vancouver Summit, the community decided they wanted to take it to the next level, right? Um, and decided to continue the process of improving OSAD and try to make it as easy as possible to deploy uh, using OpenStack. Um, and then very late this year, around fall, OSAD repository was actually moved out of StackForge and moved into the OpenStack repository. So and now it was now rebranded as OSA instead. So now, these, this repository, the things we were pulling down are actually coming right out of the OpenStack repository. So they're not in StackForge anymore. They are now officially part of OpenStack. Okay, so that's just some of the background around OSAD. That's the link where, where you can get to uh, the playbooks there on GitHub. Um, so the things you need to know about Ansible, I mean OSAD and, and its feature and benefits. Um, I have Ansible as a feature of OSA because to me, you're getting a two-in-one. You're not only getting to deploy OpenStack, but you're also getting to learn another really powerful tool called Ansible. Um, another feature that's part of o OSA is the fact that you are actually deploying your OpenStack services in containers. And not Docker containers, but the original container system, LXC containers. Um, and you may ask, well, why would I want to deploy OpenStack services out of containers and make it much more complicated than what it already is? But the reality is, is that by doing that, you can actually do in-place upgrades, right? By dropping in new containers, running new versions of OpenStack, take, take down the old containers, do some database updates, and boom, you're on the next release. So it's about portability, it's about flexibility, and that's why that was chosen to be the case. Um, you're using Linux Bridge Agent with OSA, not OVS. I repeat, Linux Bridge Agent, not OVS. The reason behind that was is that at an enterprise scale, OVS was not holding up to the challenge um, from a network perspective. So Rackspace decided to roll back and go with Linux Bridge, something that's been around much longer than OVS and can withstand enterprise volume, right? So that's another thing you're getting with OSA. You are getting a full Neutron deployment with OSA. We're not talking about Nova networking. We're talking about full Neutron, full L2, full L3 capabilities with OSA because of being able to go back to that Linux Bridge agent. Uh, and of course, it is prod ready, right? So what comes with OSA are the services that are prod ready within OpenStack. So what you may find is that OSA may not have the latest new service that was just launched at the summit. There's a reason for that, because those services need to be tested and trialed and beat up to make sure that it is production ready. So know that if you deploy OSA, you're getting the services that are production ready. So you don't have to question whether or not those services are ready or not. And the thing about OSA is, as I mentioned before, you can deploy it as an all-in-one. You can deploy it as a fully distributed uh, build for your enterprise, 1,000 nodes, uh, 10 nodes, 20 nodes, 100 nodes, it doesn't matter. OSA is just that flexible, right? So you can go in either direction with it. Um, and that's what I like about it, right? Because if you use it as an all-in-one on your, on your machine in VirtualBox, the same thing you use there is the same thing you can use to deploy it in your data center. There is no different other than changing some configuration files. So these are the high-level prerequisites under the cover stuff, as, a, as the gentleman was asking about. So again, Ubuntu 14.04 is the operating system that is required at this time for OSA. Um, that is being worked on to add more, but right now, that is it. Um, SSH client, NTP client, as I said before, time is very important. And Python 2.7 or later, 
most machines running Linux, a Linux kernel is going to have Python already, so that's probably not even an issue. The networking features. So this again, remember we talked about the bridges and, net and namespaces. These are the bridges that need to be created in order for OSA to work. Now this is a, probably the most complicated part of OSA is doing the networking part. Um, but there are a lot of examples out there on GitHub, as well as the, uh, the lab that we're stepping through today. There's a good example of how you can set up the networking on a cloud server um, as well. So there's a lot of good examples out there, so don't let that part overwhelm you. But just know that you, go, you, will, you do have to create network bridges for OSA to work, right? If you don't create all these bridges, it actually won't, it, the install won't run. And you'll be like, why am I install? Why is it not installing? Well, it's because of those network bridges. So that, that's the... Thing, the only tip that I would say is make sure your network is solid, your network configuration is solid before you go to deploy OSA. So here's some more under the cover stuff. So OSA is basically broken down into four main playbooks, one of those being optional. The HA proxy playbook is an optional playbook. Reason being is that with OSA, you're, it's intended to deploy with multiple controllers in an active format, active, active format, meaning it's meant for you to have multiple controllers all being active at one time. And that's accomplished because there is a load balancer put in front of those services. You can use a physical load balancer like your F5s or what have you, or you can use HA proxy. If you decide to use HA proxy, you can use that playbook to actually set up HA proxy for you. So not only will it install HA proxy, but it'll set up all the front end and back end stuff for HA proxy and configure everything for you. So you actually don't even have to do anything but run that playbook against your HA proxy server. Okay? So out of all those four, HA proxy one is the only optional one. The other three are required. Or you can just do like we did today, run the setup everything. The setup everything YAML file will basically execute all four of those for you, right? So that's the thing about play, uh, Ansible is, again, you can tier playbooks inside of each other um, and basically make one call and it'll do everything you need it to do, okay? Um, if you want to learn a little bit more about that, if you go to this link here uh, in the GitHub repository, it actually will show you all the playbooks that are available. And um, it breaks it down by service. It breaks it down by other features as well. Um, so, you know, something you can take a look at. And again, this, my uh, slide presentation is already up on GitHub, so uh, you have all this information. Um, some more information about it. Uh, so behind those playbooks are what I consider the most important thing, which is your configuration files. So there's four configuration files that you will have to open up and actually do something to and edit before you deploy OSA. And, this, and the information that's in these files are specific to your environment, your, your, whatever CEDAR ranges you're going to use, um, however uh, uh, infrastructure nodes you're going to use, however compute nodes you're going to set up, however sender nodes you're going to set up, whether or not you're going to put Neutron on your control node, or whether you're going to have Neutron separate. All that stuff is configured in these files. Your passwords you're going to use to set up MySQL, Rabbit, the passwords you're going to use for your service accounts, uh, such as Nova and, and Keystone, all that stuff and information is stored amongst these four configuration files. So these files are your friends. You want to make sure you get ant you know, very intimately uh, acquainted with them. And again, in this lab, you can use examples that are already provided to kind of give you a springboard, as well as in the GitHub, there's also examples of what those configuration files look like. But these are the four configuration files that you will uh, spend the most time with. And if we have time, I'll actually open those up and we can step through those a little bit. Um, so how is how's everybody install going? It's right in the root of that GitHub repository. So if you're in the GitHub repository, so it's actually called os-summit-osa-workshop.pdf. It's damaged. Yeah, I don't know if it's going to open up too great inside GitHub. You may have to uh, download it. Oh, okay. Either way, I'll send out. I can either tweet out a link or put up uh, put it up in Slide Deck, whichever one. But I can get it to you if it takes a while. Yep. So. So you had the same problem. All right. So. I, I was afraid of this. So I've been testing out the Wi-Fi in this place since I got here on Sunday afternoon. And I had a good days and I've had bad days. 
and uh, seem like we're having a bad day today. Yeah, I was able to build it. I don't know how many, I'm building, I've been building this environment every day since I've been here to make sure that it, it can be done, but I can't do anything about the Wi-Fi, unfortunately. Oh, so they changed something. Could not be sent to the remote host. Make sure the host is reachable over SSH. Something about reachability. Hmm. <coughs> just trying to install Memcache. Hmm. What's up, man? So is everybody all stuck where I am right now? Yeah. Oh, okay. You got further than me, which is concerning, but okay. So have you guys tried to kick it off again? Yeah. Is this failing again? Yeah. Okay. It failed again. I mean, it still joined. I mean, it took a while, you know, for this step update of the memcache. This yeah. Time. So. But yeah. So the issue that we are having is it has to do with connectivity between us to the deployment node, to the deployment node, to the open stack. I know it looks like it's, it's keys, but a lot of times it is because of the internet. <laughs> I know, it doesn't make you feel good. It, makes me, it doesn't make you feel good either. Yeah, so you got the same exact error as I did in the exact same place. Let's try to execute it again. 
Okay. Yeah. We'll see. Yes. Yeah, see, he has to update this this file to the to be the. Uh, do you have the handout? Uh, there's a handout. Yes. See, so key is is if you didn't get a handout, then you don't know what server to connect to. Okay. And only a certain amount of people. Handouts? No. Um, can we ask if somebody has a handout to share? Uh, you can, but then they'll they'll be uh, overriding each other. Well, like, do we have like one for each table, maybe? Like we can group up. Um. Well. Is there, is there a duplicate handout somewhere that I can borrow for just a couple of minutes? Like, can you buddy up with somebody and I can borrow one for the back table? Is that okay? Yeah. Well, you know what I'll do is maybe I'll spin up another server. Just give me a second. Oh, it probably will. No, it definitely will. No, it shouldn't. It shouldn't. It won't change our Wi-Fi situation. Well, that's a good point. I'm not, you know, you got to remember, this is a, a live repository that people make changes to. So... It's taking so long to get through these playbooks. Yeah, it's it's not even anywhere right now. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the problem is, is that if Ansible can't get back the communication from that server in a timely manner, it just drops it and says it can't talk to it. Yeah. 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 I didn't expect to have to do that, but uh, yeah. Hopefully, one person will get it completed. Okay. Okay, good. I like cheating. <laughs> sure. Yes. You try to get me in trouble, aren't you? I, I don't know. Unfortunately, I, I don't know. I d um, whether or not that Red Hat is now brought Ansible, will Red Hat maybe adopt Ansible? Yeah. You, well, let's put it this way. You, you don't just buy companies for $100 million for no reason, right? So you can, yeah. No, exactly. All right, mine died again. So since, uh, what's that? You guys are leaving? Sure. One second. Yes. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. right. the, the second part. Mm -hmm. So you got your lab built? Yeah. Oh, excellent. And during this playbook, mm -hmm. so you get a lot of errors here, creating user environment. It says no such directory is found, huh? Yeah. Uh, you're, you're on the right place. Yeah. I get this IP from the, uh, from the last common area. But you, you're using the IP that's there? Because that's a different IP. Yeah, but. So oh, so you must be, you must be using your own? Yeah. No, but this is. Yeah. If you're the, with the. Uh, yeah. So are you running OSA? Yeah. Okay. And you, you got the IP address of the utility container? Yeah. Okay. So I get this IP. This is the so this is test IP, but yeah. I got one. I put in the host file. Okay. And then run the playbook. Uh, okay. Open up your command prompt again. <coughs> Can you mind just uh, showing me the file, the host file? Yeah. Okay. Um, and you're actually on that server right now. If you do lxc ls fancy dash fancy ls yeah dash dash fancy. <coughs> so yeah, it's there. Um, it all it's going to try to do is create a user using Keystone. Mm -hmm. hmm. Try it again, if you don't mind. Yeah, now you made it mad. <laughs> broke it. He broke it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, I mean, it, obviously in probably better circumstances, it'll all work out better, but that playbook, all it does is create users, yeah. and it writes the username and password out to the screen. It, mm. It's the simplest thing ever. I don't know why it would say no, no file found. That's weird. Uh, eight. Well, it's uh, the six eight. Yeah. flavor number six. Okay. I can tell you these work. No. Just doing it on the same machine. Yep. But that's exactly what we're doing. It's just we're not using those batch scripts. That's right, all. Oh, I see. I see what you mean. I see what you mean. Yeah. I'll try that. Yeah. That one, yes. Actually, you know what? That's a good idea. Let me try that. I don't yes. Sure. Yeah, you can do this one because they left. It's okay. <laughs> no, but I, I just realized. The install is running from the server that it's installing on. I'm just SSHing to that server as a cloud server, so it's not gonna. We're not do, we're not running it from the deployment. No, we actually SSHed into the server that we're deploying it on. Dude, I've been doing this all week and it's been working in my hotel room. <laughs> of course, I get here and it bombs. So, I. I All right, it's a true failure, but this is what happens when uh, you're dealing with cloud. So I appreciate you guys still trying, but I'm going to put out a flag and probably say that you're probably not going to make it. <laughs> Um, yeah, okay. So everybody is consistently failing at the same places, so that's good.
So let's take a second and talk about operating Ansible, and then I'll give you back uh, 30 minutes of your life. I'm not going to force you to hang out. <laughs> It's connectivity. It's connectivity. It's all connectivity. Yeah. I know. It will work. Yes. So, thank you. It does work. Once you have reasonable internet, thank you. That was a good term. It does work. Trust me. It does. It really, really does. The lab is there. What I'm going to do is um, I will rebuild those servers so that you can start from the top again with the labs and I'll leave them there for a week, okay? So I'll give you a week, you can go back in, you can give it a go, um, if you have the lab handout. If you don't have the lab handout, then I will build more servers and just hit me up on Twitter and I'll give you, some, I'll give you the information, all right? So I'll give you a week to be able to connect back in and give it a go. Yes? Absolutely, I'll write a blog and uh, share more details about it. Also put up the GitHub information so that you'll have it, but I'll give you guys a week to give it a go. Once you get home, trust me, it will work. <laughs> yes? Okay, VirtualBox, right. Okay, yeah. So my wonderful coworker here also said, you know, you can do this using VirtualBox or Fusion as well if you want to do it from your laptop, right? You don't have to use a cloud server. Um, that is also a possibility, okay? Yeah. So I want to talk about operating OSA, uh, but the reality is, is I won't be able to show it to you because no one has a cloud built to actually do it with. You probably got the closest. <laughs> um, so why use Ansible with OpenStack? That's usually probably the biggest question that I get. Um, why does Ansible make sense with OpenStack? Um, so these are just some of the reasons why I have kind of fell in love with Ansible when dealing with OpenStack. Um, Ansible does not require any sort of agent. It only requires SSH and Python. <laughs> It actually really doesn't require Python, but it requires SSH to be able to connect to the devices. So you don't have any agents. You don't have to worry about chasing down configurations and things like that. Um, that's why I like Ansible. Um, there are already modules in Ansible that work with OpenStack. They actually just, with the 2.0 release of Ansible, they actually have new modules to work with OpenStack directly. Yes. Um, no, that's okay. Um, so it kind of gives you a leg up, right? Those modules are already written and know how to communicate and work with OpenStack, so you can use those modules in Ansible to be able to, to do what you need to do. Um, the playbooks are, can be written to talk against the APIs or the CLI OpenStack, right? So if you like dealing with the API and making curl requests, then you can use that. Or if you want to use the CLI directly, you can write your playbooks to call the CLI directly as well, right? So you have three choices. You have the API, CLI, or the modules in Ansible to be able to communicate with OpenStack. Um, and then last but not least, um, you know, designing roles or writing playbooks is as simple as writing an email, right? It's written in YAML language, very simple markup language. Um, to me, it's, you don't have to learn another programming language to be able to use Ansible. Um, and so it makes your life a lot easier, in my opinion, versus some of the other guys out there. Um, this is just like a visual view as to how I look at when dealing with OpenStack and Ansible. Um, you know, you're the cloud operator at the very top there. And basically, through your DevOps team, and you may be part of that DevOps team, you can create series of playbooks and roles through Ansible. And those playbooks and roles directly interface with your OpenStack cloud, right? So this is just a very simplistic view of what we kind of talked about. You can call the API. You can call the CLI of OpenStack. Um, it doesn't really matter, right? And this is just the easiest approach to me is to being able to manage my OpenStack clouds. Um, we can't do the second lab because you need the first lab to do the second lab, but that's just how that works. Um, so sorry about that. Uh, what the second lab was going to do is step you through some possible scenarios that you would see as a cloud operator. Um, so one of the scenarios was this guy right here. So you know you have your marketing department 
who never talks to IT. They just go and do what they want to do. Um, and so they purchased some website and for this special campaign and decided that, hey, you know, now I need environments. All right, I need environments for those developers to finish uh, creating that website. So they walk up to you and say, hey, you know, I need 10 tenants, 10 users, um, and yeah, I need that right now, and by the way, you know, uh, I need that, like, right now. So yeah, you can execute 10 commands or do, you know, open up Horizon Dashboard and do that 10 times, or you can create an Ansible playbook where you put in some parameters, you execute one command, and it's done in a minute. So th this is just one example of what we were going to do. So we were actually going to create 10 users, 10 projects, um, as well as assign the proper roles and have the passwords dynamically created and written to the screen. So all you have to do is copy that block. You can paste that right into an email and send it off, right? So just examples of showing how Ansible can really simplify doing things as a cloud operator. So that was one of the things. Again, the playbooks are there in GitHub. You can do it on your own. Um, you can use them and download them and use them as you wish. Um, the other scenario was, so now that the marketing department has gotten their tenants, they've gone in there and they've lost their minds and started consuming all your resources, right? Because you didn't set the proper quotas uh, for, their, for their tenant. So now you need to go back in and adjust their quotas so that they don't keep consuming all your cloud resources. So the next set of playbooks was actually going to take three of the developers, reset their quota uh, to be 30 vCPU and give them an allowance to do 30 instances. And then the rest of them, it was going to have 20 vCPU and 20 instances, right? And we were going to all do that by just editing one variable file and executing one Ansible playbook, and it would do all that for you. So instead of going through Horizon or, uh, or making a multiple CLI calls, we were actually able to do it in one command using Ansible. And again, that playbook is there in GitHub. And then the last scenario was going to be, so now that these developers have totally not lived up to what the marketing department wanted, they fired them all, got rid of them. Um, so now you as the cloud operator, you have to clean up the, everything they left behind. But before you do everything, they said, well, we want you to back up at least one of the developers' environments just in case they actually did some work that we want to look at later on. So the next scenario was is we're going to execute a playbook that was going to delete all the tenants, delete all the users, take snapshots of just one of the tenants' uh, instances, store those off, and then get rid of everything else, right? Again, update one variable file, execute one playbook command, and all that work would be done for you. So those are just examples of how you can use Ansible to make your life as a cloud operator a lot easier. Um, we can't do the lab. We can't go. Sorry. Um, skipping towards some of the tips and tricks. So what I've found when dealing with OSA, these are just some of the things that have made my life a lot easier. So anyone familiar with GitHub, you know that you can go in and deploy code by the branch or by the tag. Um, I would recommend, highly recommend, looking at the tags when looking at OSA, not just the branch. So the branch will say Ice House, Juno, Kilo, and that's all great. Um, but if you actually look at the tags, you'll realize that there's multiple revisions of those releases in between, and they make updates to them. So knowing exactly what you're deploying is actually very important with OSA. So my recommendation is, is deploy using the tag. So th the tag we used for this lab today was 11.2.3, right? Um, there's actually 11.2.4 there right now, which is the latest. Um, so you can try that as well. Um, but that's just one of my suggestions. Um, always go out and check the GitHub repo to make sure that there are not new things added to the variables files because it's constantly improving, right? So you may have your variables files stored. You may have them already updated the way you like it. But if they release a new, uh, um, a new variable in that variable file and you don't have it in yours, when you go to deploy, it'll act, uh, deploy a new version, it'll actually fail. So there's just something to keep in mind. Make sure you go in and check the new versions and make sure your variables are accurate. Triple check your networking. I can't say that a million times. Triple check your networking, triple check your networking, triple check your networking. The bridges must be created. They must be working. They must be able to communicate with each other. That's just how that works, right? So without that, the deployment will not be successful. Um, there are actually playbooks out on the GitHub repository of uh, OpenStack Ansible that will help you do cleanup. Let's say, for example, you deploy it and you want to start over again, right? There are actually playbooks out there that will kill all the containers, clean up the machine, and get you back to step one. So just take a look at those. 
playbooks, use them. Don't try and uh, you know, do it on your own, deleting containers and things like that, because what happens is, is there are actually placeholders and other configuration files that are stored off in another place that you don't know are there. So even though you've deleted that container, when you go to run the install again, it'll actually be looking for that container that you deleted, right? So it's best to use these playbooks to kind of clean up your environment. Um, there's also Galera Health Check playbooks out there that will help you check the health of your Galera cluster. I know that's a, uh, it can be a pain point at times, right? But your Galera cluster needs to be in sync, right? So you have a successful OpenStack environment. Um, so there's playbooks out there to help you with that. And last but not least, if you don't know Dash L for Ansible, um, Dash L gives you the opportunity to focus that play that playbook run at a specific machine or a specific container. So using Dash L with Ansible is your friend when you want to just do a one machine. So let's say, for example, you want to add another compute node to your environment. Um, you can basically run the playbooks again, but you just add Dash L, the name of that new compute node, and it will only run the playbooks against that newest machine. So that's just a, a tip and trick about Ansible. Dash L is your friend. Um, these are just some of the reference materials. So this is uh, really important stuff. The OSA install guide. Um, there's some additional instructions to that install guide that Rackspace has put together that you can also help to kind of supplement some really good examples. Um, there's a quick start all-in-one install uh, guide, which is uh, very helpful. It uh, uses a series of batch scripts to do exactly what we did, but in probably a little bit more simplified fashion. And of course, if you'd like to follow OSA as far as news and updates, this is a, a link there as well that shows you some of the newer things that they're doing. One of the things that they're working on right now is possibly an image-based deployment using OSA. So uh, actually just pushing down an image that actually will run OpenStack. So anyway, that's just some of the latest, greatest stuff. Um, thank you again. I severely apologize, but you know this was always a 50-50 risk using the Wi-Fi here. Um, again, I will leave those servers there for a week. I will reset them back so that you can start the lab from the top again. Um, and, uh, and if you didn't get a lab handout with a server, come up to me at the end and uh, I'll take your name down or at least your Twitter handle or something and then I'll create some servers for you and get you set up, okay? Thank you again, guys. I appreciate it, all right? <laughs> and it does work. <laughs> Yes.